I'm delighted that we have this privilege of once again opening our Bibles to the 1 Corinthians text. We're in the 10th chapter, and we'll look at the first 14 verses in this time together. I have had the privilege of teaching this text many times down through the years. I've called it a number of titles, and I must recognize now I have mistitled this text for the message. I have simply called it Lessons from the Past, and that is true. It's exactly what it is. But I believe a better title would be A Response to Andy Stanley's Coming Unhitched from the Old Testament. (laughs) Because in reality, what we find in this text, lessons from the Old Testament, lessons from the past that the Apostle Paul is using to teach the believers at Corinth, in the church at Corinth, how they ought to live. And it's a marvelous text, by the way, in that light. And looking at what Paul is saying as he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, he is talking to them about liberty and the liberty that we have as believers and how we ought not to abuse that liberty and make it license. And he goes back to the biblical historical cases of deliverance of God's people down through the corridors of yesteryear as he's teaching the believers at Corinth. He points out that many times the... uh, nation of Israel would be delivered from bondage. They would then follow and go fall into another sin, another bondage, and go back into bondage as a result of disbelief and disobedience to God. And he says, in essence, you may be free from one evil, but in bondage to another. The apostle Paul here fully recognized that Christian liberty could be misused. And he uses the illustration of the Old Testament saints, if you will, the Old Testament children of Israel, he uses their life as an illustration as to what God had done and how God is the same, and therefore we need to listen up as what Paul is saying. Someone has said, and may I quote, those who are ignorant of history are bound to repeat it. That's what Paul is trying to get the believers at Corinth to understand. He didn't want the Corinthian Christians to repeat the sins that their fathers had in Israel while they were in their wilderness journeys. And you'll hear this again during the course of the message. When they left Egypt, there were about six million. I don't know who counted them, but that's what historians tell us. When they started to enter into the promised land being led by Joshua, after 40 years and after God had to literally put to death uh, millions of them, there were about two and a half to three million Jews to enter in. And that's because all of them that were uh, over 20 years old uh, and older uh, had to die. Uh, Joshua and Caleb and those that were 20 and less lived through the wanderings of the 40 years in the wilderness. God was teaching them through the test that he was placing them in. And that's what Paul is talking to the believers at Corinth about, that there is a lesson to be learned from the Old Testament. So stand, if you will, please, out of honor and recognition of the reading of the Word. As I read audibly, follow with me in your Scripture, the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians, the first 14 verses. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the uh, cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As in the right, and it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Verse 13 and 14. 
There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, flee from idolatry. Thank you, and we may be seated. There are three things that I want us to look at in the time that we have allotted. And I'll be very honest with you. It is very, very difficult to squeeze in this lesson and these 14 verses in the time that we have allotted. So, but I want us to do the best we can that we'll understand what the text is saying. And it is designed to be applicable in our own lives even today as the Apostle Paul taught it to believers at Corinth. There are three things as we think on the subject, lessons from the past. The privilege of God's grace reminded in the first four verses. The perversion of God's grace reviewed in verses 5 through 10. And then the promise of God's grace revealed in verses 11 through 14. Notice, first of all, the privilege of God's grace reminded in verses 1 through 4. Paul had already pointed out, as you recall, in verse 27 of chapter 9, Paul says, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. Ah, documents, disapprove. The Apostle Paul had already pointed out that he didn't want to be disqualified. He did not want to be disapproved after running the race. And he begins this text then in verse 1, moreover. And that word moreover is the same little Greek word gar because he's saying, and he's making that connectivity to verse uh, 27 in chapter 9. He says, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. He didn't say, I don't want to be, you to be ignorant brethren. He said, I want you, don't want you to be ignorant. That is, I, I do not want you to be without knowledge. I want you to understand, Paul says, I want you to understand and fathom what I'm trying to teach. I want you to have knowledge of the past and the lessons of God's grace from the past and the lessons of God's privilege from the past. And he's saying to the Corinthian believers, I want you to understand that as we look at what he is saying, I want us to realize Paul is saying that God's grace and God's privilege and he wants the believers at Corinth to recognize God's grace and God's privilege so that no one will use that grace and privilege as license to carry out their lives as they please. All the children of Israel were in the race, as he points out in the text. But God meted out severe punishment for most of them because of unbelief. And as a result of that unbelief, Multitudes were destroyed, 23,000 in one day. That was just on one occasion. Thousands of others, by the way, later. But notice, first of all, the supernatural protection. Notice in that first verse how that all our fathers were under the cloud. He uses that word all five times in this unit of thought. He wants the Corinthian believers to recognize that you believers at Corinth, just as the Old Testament uh, uh, Israelis, he wanted uh, them to understand that there's no difference. He wants them to understand that there's no one left out. And he places that emphasis on the uh, believers at Corinth because he wants them to understand there must be a unity in the faith. Then with no exceptions, with no exceptions, just as all believers possess the same justification and our standing before the Lord, according to uh, Galatians 5, 26 and 27, so also he wanted them to understand the Isra Israelites shared in the redemption from Israel, and here we see the scripture speaking of that divine supernatural guidance and protection from God for the children of Israel, and he wants the believers at Corinth to recognize that same divine protection, but also their need to be faithful in serving and surrender. You see, the cloud guaranteed God's presence, his protection, and his guidance. And we could go to uh, text after text after text in uh, the book of Exodus and validate what this text is saying. And that's what Paul is drawing from, is from the Old Testament historical record for them to understand that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He says there, everyone that is all, both young and old, weak and strong, all had God's supernatural protection in the wilderness as the children of Israel traveled. Just as the children of Israel experienced that privilege of God's grace, that privilege of God's 
God's protection. He also wants the believers at Corinth to understand that is the same God we're serving. That's the same principle that I'm speaking of and teaching you today, Paul is saying. The Corinthians had experienced God's grace and God's salvation, but they were uh, totally deficit in the understanding of the realization of faithfulness and commitment to God and that God operates the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as a result of that, as God punished the children of Israel, so also that same punishment, that same judgment is standing to be meted out for those that disobey God, for those that disavow the historical record, if you will. Notice not only the supernatural protection, but notice the supernatural preservation in verse 1, the latter portion. And all pass through the sea. Paul points back to the divine supernatural deliverance and the preservation through the sea. In fact, it's a wonderful study in Exodus chapter 14, verse 21 and following. Can you imagine, listen very carefully, what Paul is painting the picture of from the Old Testament historical record. Paul is painting the picture there. Can you imagine the water is in front of you, the mountains are looming on both sides of you, and the wicked evil host of the Egyptians are hot on your heels right behind you. Can you imagine that setting? And that's the setting, that's the scene, and there is a desperate situation at hand. And Paul is wanting them to understand that same situation of helplessness and hopelessness without the lordship of Jesus Christ to deliver and to preserve. But God sent the wind, he divided the Red Sea, and his servant Moses stretched out his hand over the waters. In fact, in Exodus uh, chapter 14, verse 22 says, And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. The Apostle Paul is using the historical record of the Old Testament. This is the reason it is so disingenuous, it is so dis, uh, divisive, and it serves a disservice to the Christians across America for any preacher to stand in the pulpit and to say we must come unhitched from the Old Testament. That shows, in my opinion, and this is me, some can disagree if you like, that shows the sheer ignorance of the totality of the Word of God for anybody to make that kind of statement. What would Paul be talking about in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, if it were not a record? record of the Old Testament to link it with the New Testament to be used, as he says here in a moment in this text, it's used for our example. It's the word typos. It's a type that we might understand what God has done then and is still operative today. May I remind us, we see the supernatural protection, the supernatural preservation. There's also a supernatural purpose in that second verse. And we're all baptized, baptizo, to immerse into Mo, unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. That word there, baptized, does not mean that we're baptized, as the Calvinists say, that we're immersed into Moses. Therefore, the church is simply spiritual Israel. That's a linkage that they place there that's not found. It is simply talking about the fact that we're all immersed in, placed under. In fact, Alan Redpath said it this way. This is a quaint way of saying that God's purpose for his children, that uh, they should be united in, and disciplined, linked together under the leadership of one man. They were made into one community and ultimately into a great nation, end quote. I couldn't have placed it, stated it better myself. May I remind us, this is not talking about the word water baptism or immersion for salvation today. Just as water baptism is a picture of being buried in Christ, this is talking about being immersed in that historical record of the fellowship and the leadership of Moses himself. The cloud and the sea indicates there how God had uh, protected and separated the children of Israel from the enemies that were after them trying to destroy them. They had a common unity, a single leader, a common purpose, and that the just as the children of Israel were forged into one people under God's leadership, so also the believers today are saved, immersed in Christ with one purpose and one plan and one goal for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to be the uh, front in society to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we are baptized, immersed into Christ, our head is Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying here to the Corinthians, you have one head, and that head is Jesus Christ. Just as Moses was the head, the leadership, they followed him. They were immersed in that leadership role. And Paul is saying to the believers at Corinth, Jesus Christ is our head. Jesus Christ is the one that we're to follow. He is saying there, we're to become one in Christ, one people, one plan, one purpose. In fact, you'll find that in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, and in the 13th verse. 
I made a little mark to note how we destroy the unity of the body, each one doing his own thing in the household of faith even today. And Paul is dealing with that in a very broad brush, and he will narrow down with the focus in just a moment in this text. We see the supernatural protection, supernatural preservation, supernatural purpose. But I want you to notice the supernatural provision that Paul is pointing out to the children of, uh, at, from the children of Israel to the believers at Corinth. Notice in verse 3 and 4, and did all, again it's the word all, inclusive, all eat the same spiritual meat, verse 4, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drink of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. You're seeing the Christophany of the Old Testament. He's pointing out that Christ was in the Old Testament. Christ was the one that was carrying out the work of that uh, providing the water for the children of Israel in the wilderness journey. There's an old song that says, In Christ, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. And Paul is pointing out to the believers at Corinth that it's Jesus Christ yesterday, Jesus Christ in providing for those in the wilderness journey, and it's Christ in his supernatural provision. There are two things that he points out in that verse, in verse 3 and 4. First of all, the supply, and secondly, the source. Notice what he says, the meat that is the food, the manna, and that's found in Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 through 16. The manna for 40 years, God provided that supernatural food. In fact, I find it fascinating. In Psalm 78, 25, it calls it angel food. So we talk about an angel food cake or angel food uh, uh, bread, if you will. It comes from that text in Psalm 78, 25. And it's speaking of that manna that uh, God provided for the children of Israel. You might recall in the study of that, little pebbles of white uh, uh, fluffy uh, bread. And they looked at it and they asked the question, what is it? And that same word is the word manna. It's the manna from heaven that God provided for them that they would be provided for. 24-7 for that 40 years in the wilderness journey. That's the supply. And Paul says here the source of it was, and that rock was Christ, the source of the water, the Lord Jesus Christ, the source of the food that's provided, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in John 6, verse 30 through 39, the scripture says that Jesus Christ is that true bread from heaven, says that he is the living water. And it's through Jesus Christ that the apostle Paul is saying to the believers at Corinth, you need to recognize that Christ was found in the Old Testament, that Jesus Christ was the provider in the Old Testament, the same as he is the provider for you and your life even today. In fact, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. That's Christ. And Paul is pointing out that Jesus Christ is in the Old Testament just as in the New Testament. Again, it goes back. The question begs to be asked and answered. Why would you want to come unhitched from the Old Testament? Without the Old Testament, much of the New Testament will have no fundamental foundational foundation for its statements and for what is said and what is taught. It is vital that we understand. And some might say, well, why are you so hung up on that? I am because it is so detrimental and destructive for Christendom today for anybody to make that kind of statement. We need to understand that without the Old Testament, we have no foundation for the New Testament. Jesus and the other and his disciples quoted from the Old Testament over 300 times in the New Testament. What would those quotes mean? Where would they be derived from if we have no Old Testament? The privilege of God's grace reminded. Notice, secondly, the perversion of God's grace reviewed in verses 5 through 10, the overwhelming bulk of the text. Notice, first of all, the severe punishment. Keep in mind, the Apostle Paul is preaching and teaching the believers at Corinth. The church at Corinth was a mixed up, messed up, divided, dissentious church. They were involved in everything that you could think of and still wanted to embrace and say we're just going to love each other and love is predominant so it doesn't matter what you do, what you say, where you go, we're just going to love everybody. And that's the mindset you find in society so much today. Notice this severe punishment Paul points out in verse 5. But with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Many. We get our word megos, mega, multitudes, a whole host. They were allowed to die in the wilderness except for those that were 20 years old and for Joshua and Caleb. May I remind us those that were 20 years old and younger and Joshua and Caleb. And that was the, because of Joshua and Caleb were the two out of the 12 spies. It was those two men that said, we believe God. 
They had belief and faith in God when they saw the giants in the land, when they saw uh, the uh, uh, size of the fruit, et cetera, et cetera. They believed God said, go in and possess the land. They believed that it was possible. Had the minority report, the majority report, the majority report won. Therefore, they disbelieved God, and as a result of disobedience to God and disbelief of God, they wandered in the wilderness for some 40 years. Joshua and Caleb, the two that believed God, the minority report. And by the way, I've used that many times for an example in teaching ecclesiology, that that was a church conference, if you will, that had a majority report and a minority report. The majority report won, and as a result of that, the majority happened to be wrong and led them in the wrong direction, and as a result of that, suffered God's discipline and judgment as a result of it. May I remind us, we understand here that it was because of unbelief. The word overthrown means to be cast down, to be spread out, to be stretched out as if by some hurricane-forced wind. And as I said by way of brief introduction, they started out with about 6 million Jews coming out of Egypt. By the time they got in the promised land, uh, perhaps as little as 2 million there as a result of their disbelief. They were given everything, food, clothing, and shelter, provision, protection, preservation, with a divine purpose, and that would be that they would faith God and follow God. They failed over and over and over. They failed, they faltered, and they fell, and that's what Paul is trying to teach the believers at Corinth. There must be a faith that follows, and what God says ought to be done. The greater the privilege, the greater the responsibility, same. We see that very thing today. Many are being scattered and overthrown because of failure and refusal to be obedient to the Word of God. May I remind us we have great privileges in Christ, liberties in Him, but those liberties ought not to become license to do as we please. And that's what I find in our Christian society today more than anything else. The mindset is, I am free. I know Christ. I've got my ticket to heaven. I can do whatever I please, go as I please, do as I please. And that is none of anybody's business is the basic mindset in society. Paul is saying even as Moses was disqualified to enter the promised land because of disobedience, God still speaks through the rock. And as God had told him, speak to the rock, he struck the rock. As a result of that, he was not allowed to go in to the promised land. Be careful how we run the race. Be careful how the race is being run. We see the severe punishment. We see the spiritual purpose in verse 6. Now these things, what things? All that he's just recited about the children of Israel and about the Old Testament history. All that he's recited about the wilderness journey and what the people had done and their, in their disobedience. Now, these things were our examples to the intent. That is, for the purpose that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. They who? The children of Israel. They who? Those that were in the wilderness journey. Those that were came out of bondage place themselves back in bondage to the lust of the flesh. And that's what Paul is teaching them there. May I remind us, why do we study the Old Testament? Why do we have the Old Testament? Paul gives us a clear analogy between the experience of the children of Israel and the Corinthian church and for us today. He says the Old Testament text is for our example. And may I remind us, he is talking about just in this text. But in general, we can say all of the Old Testament is given for our learning, for our example, for our instruction, for our edification, for our illumination as to who God is and what God does. You can study the Old Testament and see real life stories of those that love God, those that serve God, would stumble and fall and see the judgment and the justice of God fall as a result of disobedience. And that is true today, just as it was then. And Paul says, this is a clear analogy he's saying here. This is what God has done there. He says it's our example. It's the little Greek word typos, and it means type or pattern. As we study how God dealt with the Old Testament, how God dealt with the children of Israel, we need to learn what God has said, what God has done, and therefore avoid those same pitfalls. I don't know how you can put it any clearer. That's Paul's uh, lesson. That's Paul's message. That's Paul's challenge to the children of uh, the the uh, uh, saints at uh, Corinth. He's trying to teach them what God had done at Israel and with the Israelites. We can learn to avoid sin. How to keep from repeating the failures and the disobedience of those that have gone on before us. 
I believe that so often as Christians today, we can see things happen to other believers, the downfall, the pitfalls, the problems, uh, the faltering and falling and getting up and uh, falling down, and we can see that, and somehow, some way, we think, that's not going to happen to me. That can, In fact, Paul covers that in the last couple of verses in this text that is before us. We need to understand this is a lesson from the Old Testament that the Apostle Paul is trying to teach the uh, believers at Corinth. Our problem today is we fail to look at we fail to learn from, we fail to be obedient to the Lordship of Jesus Christ as is found in the Scripture. We fail to be obedient to what God's Word says to us because somehow, some way, whether we speak it or not, whether we verbalize it as Andy Stanley has, multitudes of Christians today have literally come unhitched from the Old Testament, feeling that somehow, some way, it's old and therefore this is new and new is always better than the old. That's the mindset. And that's what Paul is trying to get the believers at Corinth to understand. May I remind us our problem is the failure to learn from history. Thus our nation today, when we fast forward as a result of a failure as a nation to see our history, we're going to falter and fall in the future. I watched some of the Kamala Harris speech today and she said that under her leadership, we're going to bring back morals in America. Under her leadership, we're going to provide uh, education for everyone at no cost because it is a right. Uh, under her leadership, she said, we're going to bring about health care for everybody because it's our right. And I challenged uh, as I watched that, where is it a right? Where do you, is it in the Bill of Rights? Is it in the Constitution? Where do you find that right? May I remind us, our nation is faltering today as a result of not looking back to our fundamental foundation for our founding fathers and the history of our nation. Why we have survived 240 plus years is because of God's hand on America, because of God blessing America, because our fundamental foundation of our founding documents, our founding fathers being based on the word of God. Amen. And the Christians at Corinth, are faltering and failing to be obedient because they do not understand the Old Testament scrolls of what took place with the nation of Israel and Paul is giving them a lesson from history past as how to apply it in our lives today. Our homes are collapsing today. Broken churches today. Failure of teaching the word of God brings that about. We have uh, denomination after denomination embracing the LGBTQ community, embracing lifestyles that God has already condemned, that God's word has already said is unholy and is unfathomable and ought not to be lived. And here the Apostle Paul is trying to teach the children in the churches at Corinth the lesson from the Old Testament. Not only do we see the severe punishment, the spiritual purpose, but notice the sinful practices in verse 6 through verse 10. The Bible gives us a list here of five sinful practices. I'm going to be very brief with it, though we could be elongated in looking at it through the biblical text. But there are five sinful practices of the children of Israel. And they are out of bondage. They are free. And as a result of being out of bondage and free, the mindset is I'm free, free, free. You can't tell me what to do. I can live as I please. And that's basically a good illustration of the children of Israel and their mindset. First of all, we see their inordinate desire. Lust. We should not lust after evil things that is bad, poneros, bad things, as they, speaking of the children of Israel, also lusted. He says there's nothing wrong with wanting something. There's nothing wrong with having a need. There's nothing wrong with the desire. But according to God's will, we ought to have that desire to want what God wants for us. Multitudes today, even as believers, are infected with, are vaccinated with the old greed, the old lust of wanting something new, wanting something different, wanting new food, new car, new clothing, even some saying, I want a new husband, a new wife. <laughs> Somehow there's a mindset that we must change. May I remind us, that is the problem that the children of Israel had. Numbers chapter 11, verse 13, they cried out uh, to give us meat that we may eat. God gave them their demand, but while they were still eating, God sent a plague upon them according to Numbers chapter 11, verse 33 and following. As a result of their literally chiding and challenging and debating with God, man is the same today. In fact, we find that first of all in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden, Eve looked at the fruit. I don't know whether it's an apple, an orange, or banana. There are a lot of folks that have come up with it, and they doesn't make any difference. She looked at the fruit, and it was beautiful. She touched it, and it felt good. 
She said, I bet it tastes good. Adam, come on over here, son. Let's eat this thing together. By the way, that's the first act of feminism in the Bible, where she dominated the husband, and the husband succumbed to her directions rather than him saying, no, 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 you remember God said we can't, therefore we can't do that. We find as a result of that that sin came upon all men. It was that inordinate craving of something that had been denied, something that had been, that we've been told no about, and somehow, some way, there's a caving into that desire that mankind has not learned the lesson even to this day. The inordinate craving of something other than what God wants and what God has planned for us. That idea that I want something new, that idea of I want something different, that craving and that lusting after. Then not only we see the inordinate desire, but the idolatry displayed. Verse 7, this happened, by the way, when you study the Old Testament text in Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 and following. Moses still is on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments, the law from God. The people under Aaron built a golden calf, as you recall. Build a golden calf. By the way, when you study that, it's fascinating. It said they broke off the earrings and uh, their bracelets and their necklaces, etc., etc. It was all melted down and made the golden calf. I've never been able to, with my little minuscule brain, understood, never been able to understand why they were willing to do that. Why, what in the world other than a demonic delusion caused them to do that? But that is what Paul is saying to them as he reminds them of their idolatry that is displayed. The people under Aaron built that golden calf. And then around that golden calf, naked, drunk, stupor, in a sexual orgy, worshiped that golden calf. And the apostle Paul warns the Corinthians, don't do it. Many say, you can't tell me what to do. Many will say today, I'm free and I can worship however I please. But the Corinthians, keep in mind, they'd come out of the old cultic practice, the origins that were in the churches of the cult practices of that day, where they were worshiping the sex goddess. And many of them had fallen back into that. And the Apostle Paul is saying, in essence, don't you understand what happened to the children of Israel? Don't you understand you cannot do that today? He's giving them a lesson from the past to teach them what they ought to do in today's life and living for Jesus Christ. They were serving false gods, idols of anything that stands uh, uh, that is between you and God. There are a lot of folks today that have idols and they do not recognize them as idols. It could be a husband, it could be a wife, it could be a child, it could be a boat, it could be a car, it could be some hobby, it could be money, it could be pleasure. Anything that prevents one from serving Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords can become an idol. You don't have to have one and put him up on the dash of the car. You don't have to have one and put him up on the mantelpiece of the dresser for it to be an idol. That idol could be parked in the garage. That idol could be uh, uh, someone that you love and someone that you place your emphasis on. There are a lot of folks today that will have that idol as a son or a daughter or a child and use that as an excuse. I can't worship. I have to stay home and do this. I have to do that. I have to do the other. And that becomes the idol that prevents them from serving Jesus Christ and surrendering to him as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. May I remind us, he was trying to teach them at Corinth. Some felt that they could worship in those cultic origins and that would be okay. Paul said, neither be ye. He says in that uh, seventh verse, stop becoming, don't be like, stop doing it, stop it and stop it now. It's what Paul was saying. Their inordinate desires, their idolatry displayed, their immorality detailed in the eighth verse. Neither let us, notice Paul didn't say let you, neither let us. He is inclusive of himself. He realizes his humanity. He realizes the weakness of the flesh. And the apostle Paul said, neither let us commit fornication, sexual sin, pornea. And that word fornication, sexual sin, that word pornea is the umbrella for all sexual sins. Not like some pastors of the 20th and 21st century are saying, that Pernier deals with uh, sexual sin uh, before marriage and adultery is sexual sin after marriage. Most of you have heard that, haven't you? That's not what that word means at all. Pernia is the umbrella of all sexual sins, and under that umbrella happens to be adultery that takes place in the life of a person after marriage. Sexual sin is any sin that is dishonoring and unholy before God. That sexual relationship ought to be in the bonds of holy matrimony, as the Bible calls it. Marriage is the only way. And the Apostle Paul says, Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day 23,000. 
And that's when they were having that orgy around that golden calf. And God uh, destroyed 23,000 at one time in one day as a result of it. Wouldn't you think that God's against that? Wouldn't you think that somehow, some way, God's saying don't? Wouldn't you believe that somehow, some way, the Apostle Paul is saying to the believers at Corinth that this is a lesson from the past. We must not come unhitched from the Old Testament. We must understand what the Old Testament is saying, and that's our illustration. And we ought to understand that as a type for all of us today. This was happening at Corinth. It's happening today. The LGBTQ groups are invading our churches. Sodomite marriages are taking place. You have entire churches where the leadership, homosexuals, the pastor, homosexual. It is a crying shame before holy God that we have devolved into that condition today in our nation. The Apostle Paul is talking about that. It's not just an alternative lifestyle. It's called sin. It is called sin when an individual disavows and disallows the plan of God in one's life. Not only do we see their inordinate desires and their idolatry displayed and the immorality detail, but notice the insubordination described in verse 9. Insubordination. He says, neither let us tempt Christ, literally, to test him, to try him. Let me just give you a little brief word study quickly so that it will not be misunderstood. Periosmos can be translated test, testing, trial, or temptation. Either one, depending on the uh, context, determines the word that is used in the English Bible. But may I remind us, he says, neither let us tempt Christ. That literally means to test him, to try him. Some of those also, as some of those also tempted or tested and were destroyed. It is, uh, Paul is saying, go back to Numbers 21, uh, verses 4 and following. Israel became uh, weary and disillusioned and disheartened and discouraged in their long journey. And as a result of that, they spoke out against Moses. And that speaking out against Moses is tempting, is testing Christ, the Apostle Paul is saying. Don't let us do that. That is saying, here's what the Word of God says. I'm going to test God. I'm going to test and see if he'll do something. There are a lot of folks today, because they've gotten away with sin over and over and over and over again, they think that it's covered, everything is okay, and nothing will happen. Ahab and Jezebel thought that for 20 years, and finally it caught up with them. Multitudes today, and the Apostle Paul is saying that, multitudes today fall into that category. The children of Israel spoke out against Moses. They complained against him. They questioned God's plan, questioned God's program, questioned God's provision, and blamed it all on God's leader. (laughs) I made a little marginal note. It's not applicable here. But multitudes of churches, when things go wrong, when the membership's not growing, they blame the pastor. It's always historically true that the leader gets blamed regardless of whose responsibility it happened to have been. And that's what they were doing with Moses. They were blaming Moses, criticizing Moses, chiding and challenging against Moses. May I remind us, have you ever looked back and said, oh, if I could only go back, if I could only go back to the bar room, if I could only go back to the lounges, if I could only go back to the nightlife, if I could only go back to the swinging life, That's what the children of Israel were doing. They were looking back at what they had in Egypt and they were saying that, oh, there were the leeks and the garlics and all that we needed and all that we wanted. We don't have that today. They were griping and bellyaching against Moses and Moses was God's chosen servant to lead them and to do what God had said to do. But they were chiding and challenging that. Many died according to the scripture, but they could look and live according to John chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. In the wilderness journey where the serpents were biting in them and they were dying, God told him to make a brazen uh, uh, rod and put that serpent around it and lift it up. And all the children of Israel had to do was to look and to live. And Jesus Christ used that as the example in the John's Gospel as he was speaking to uh, Nicodemus. He was saying that all you, had to do, all you have to do is look and live. Look at Christ and live. He is the answer. And Paul is saying that to the believers at Corinth. Rather than their insubordination, arguing, Paul is saying you need to look to Jesus. And finally, in that 10th verse, their ingratitude decried. 
Notice, neither murmur ye, that is, stop murmuring, stop it, discontinue it, do it now. Murmuring and griping and belly aching and complaining, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed, that is, killed by the destroyer, teaching, teaching them that God destroyed them as a result of the murmuring, the belly aching, and the griping. I made a little marginal note, it's so sad today that we have so many that murmur and gripe and bellyache at what we face in life. Somehow, some way, we've come to believe in American Christianity that Christianity ought to be simple, it ought to be easy, it ought to be a soft life, it ought to be where everybody just uh, gives us the accolades and somehow everything is pleasant without any problems. That's a far cry from the truth of the Christian life. And that's what Paul is trying to get them to see and understand. You can look at Numbers 14 and Numbers 16 and following and find that they griped, complained, and murmured against Moses. They griped about everything. And God sees, may I remind us, and understands. In some churches, there's a gripe and complaining, it's too hot, it's too cold. Message is too long, it's too loud, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Griping and complaining is what they were doing. And Paul is reminding them that the saints at Corinth, you ought not to do that. Think of all that the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. All he's done for each of us individually. We ought to pause and praise him. The sins of Israel were unbelief, disobedience, dissatisfaction, discouragement, and God judged them as a result of it. And all of that was applicable to the saints at Corinth. Paul is dealing with it in a lump sum fashion because of their dissension, their division, their dissatisfaction, their griping and belly aching of everything that was taking place. But I want you to notice finally in verses 11 through 14, the promise of God's grace revealed. He gives an answer. He ends on a very positive, definitive, definite note. Notice the special purpose in verse 11. Why do all these things in the Old Testament history, why do we have all of them before us in the New Testament? Because God's dealing with Israel is more than just happenstance. God's dealing with the nation of Israel is more than just history. The Old Testament should be more than just curiosity. The Old Testament of Israel and how God dealt with the nation of Israel is for our pattern and for our precaution. Notice the pattern. Now all these things, he's using the word all again. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. All that God did with Israel. Paul says, are now our examples. And that word example is the word typos. We get the word types, example, pattern, model. He says, what God has done with the children of Israel becomes our model. It becomes an illustration example for our lives and how we ought to live. What God did with Israel, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as a result of that, whatever God did then, he'll do today. God does not change. Much too often, Hollywood sets the example. Much too often, Hollywood sets the, becomes the type. Much too often, Hollywood becomes the pattern by which lives are molded. It's the garbage channel that has the Kardashians. I believe that stuff's on 24-7. And you can't roll the dial on your television without crossing it someplace. And my bride said so many times, I believe that the kids today, the teenagers today, are watching that garbage and modeling their lives after the lives they see in that garbage. And Paul is saying to the children, the, the believers at Corinth, don't you dare understand anything but the fact God is using this that I'm giving you the history of Israel. He's using it for our type, for our model, for our pattern to live by as our example. And then he gives a precaution. And they, notice, and they are written, that's the Old Testament, for our admonition. The Old Testament warning, the Old Testament life, the Old Testament model is what God has done, is our warning, our caution, our precaution, our correction. Why is that so? So that we will mold our lives according to God's word. So that we will recognize God's word and God's warning and take caution and result that results in disbelief and disobedience. And we will avoid that disobedience and disbelief in holy God. May I remind us, God will chasten today just as he did then. Look at how God dealt with Israel and still deals with sin today in the same fashion. Notice he says in that 11th verse, upon whom the ends of the world are come. 
Literally, he says, the ones living in the last days. Literally, the days of God's wrap-up of this old world. Some may say, this can't happen to me. But Paul is saying, yes, it can, as he writes to the believers at Corinth. And he writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. It's a lesson for us today. Look at that 12th verse, the serious precaution. Wherefore? When you see a wherefore, you look to see what's gone there for. Wherefore? Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. A severe warning. Paul says, now listen, saint at Corinth. You might say, that can't happen to me. I don't need that lesson. It doesn't apply to me. It's not applicable in my life. And multitudes of Christians say that very same thing today. The Apostle Paul is giving that precise, that very serious precaution and that precise warning. He's saying, if you think you're okay, if you think that your sins are okay, if you feel that somehow, some way, God's not going to punish you as he did Israel, take heed, listen up. God is the same. Some today, just as at Corinth, felt that they would never be punished. Somehow, some way, we gloss over what God said and what God did in the Old Testament. And we look at that as yesteryear. But it's our example of what God is still doing today. Though God's wheels of justice grind slowly, they grind ever so surely. And what the children of Israel experienced in God's justice and God's judgment is true today. Proverbs sixteen eighteen says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. There's that haughty, arrogant spirit that the believers at Corinth had. And the Apostle Paul is trying to deal with that. Finally, I want you to notice in verse 13 and 14, the supernatural promise. Notice the common test. There hath no temptation, periosmos. There's no testing that's taken you, that has captured you, overcome you, seized you, but that which is common, that is ordinary, normal, natural experience by every man. Pretty powerful statement. Pretty powerful statement. God says, when you're experiencing a test, when you're feeling lonely, when you feel fearful, when you're feeling weak, when you're feeling that everything's against you, don't you dare believe that it's only you because everything that God does in testing is to test and to refine and to prove our faith in us. You ever tested? Mm -hmm. Most of us want to avoid the test. Most of us simply want to get an A plus without going through the exam. <laughs> God doesn't work that way. He gives the test first, and then we learn the lesson. And Paul is saying there that that's what God is doing, the common test, the common test. May I remind us, we're not alone. The Lord Jesus Christ is closer to us than our next breath. He knows every need. He knows every heartbeat. And every human being will experience testing. It's normal, the Scripture says, and God's using that test to prove, to refine, to mold, and to develop our faith and commitment and strength in serving Him. Satan, in the midst of that test now, is going to try to tempt. You find that very clearly in Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 1 of, and verse 12 of Mark's gospel says the Holy Spirit of God, Holy Spirit drove Jesus in the wilderness. Why did he drive him there? To test him, not to say that he would fall under the temptation of Satan, but to prove that he's God and could not yield to that test, that temptation. Just as you've heard me use the illustration with a jet airplane when it is manufactured, it's uh, taxed it out on the runway, the test pilot gets in it, flies, puts it in all of its uh, spins and its dives and its uh, uh, shutoffs, etc., 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 to prove that that plane will do what it was manufactured to do. Jesus Christ was put into that test to prove that he's God and could not yield to the temptation of Satan. Notice not only the common test, but notice the comforting trust, but God... But God is faithful who will not suffer or to allow you to be tempted, tested above, beyond that which you are able. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to know that when we're going through a test and sometimes a person will say, I just can't handle it anymore. I can't take anymore. I can't bear up under this burden anymore. Somehow, some way, we're trying to become God and say that we're going to determine when the test is over. 
May I remind us here, it's wonderful to know that God is in control. He knows how to handle us. He knows what we can handle. We can't say, I can't go through another day. God says, yes, you can. I can't handle another problem. God says, yes, you can. I find it marvelously wonderful when we analyze the Word of God to realize that God is entrusting us with those tests to prove and to refine and to mold our faith and to let us see what God already knows will be the end result in the midst of that test. God has us in mind, and he wants us to see and be faithful. Lamentation 3, 22 and 23. It is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. In verse 13, the latter portion, not only do we see the common test and the comforting trust, but the course taken. Notice but will with every temptation, with every test, also make a way, a route, a pattern, a plan, an escape, that you may be able to endure it, to bear it. No test will be too big for us to handle if it's under the auspices of the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. Escape is the little word ek beson. It means to get out of to go through and to come out on the other side. It's the same word, by the way, that's used in Acts chapter 27, verses 18 through 38, of the sailors lightening the load of the ship in the midst of the storm, throwing overboard everything that was extra, everything that was not needed, everything that weighted it down. Literally, and during the test, we must throw overboard everything that pulls us down. We can't hang on to the world and hang on to God. We can't hang on to these things and still run the race that Christ has set before us. Jesus knows what we're experiencing, and he's going to provide an escape. The common test, the comforting trust, the course taken. Look at that 14th verse, and we close. The caution trumpeted. That wherefore, wherefore, my dearly beloved, that's gender, genuinely, genuinely greatly loved ones, flee idolatry. That was his wrap-up statement. He is saying there, the children of Israel were idolatrous, following idolatry, turned their minds and their hearts and their lives, their eyes away from God. He is saying to the saints at Corinth, run from it. Run from idolatry. They were flirting with idolatry, the cultic practices and the false gods and the temple sacrifices. A neighbor and friend or family member says, come with me, go to my church to worship. I say, no, 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 because it may be false worship. A number of years ago, we had a young lady in our church that she was faithful. And then after she got involved in church and serving the Lord, all of a sudden her boss at work wanted her to come to his church. And then uh, some of her friends wanted her to come to their church and worship with them. And one of the friends happened to be a cult member of a, quote, Christian cult. And she came to me and said, what do you think? I said, no, don't you dare. Don't you dare. You can't do that. It's an impossibility. She did. And her life started tumbling afterwards that you just would not believe. I believe it's as a result of being introduced to the cultic church service, if you can call it that, that her friend was involved in. May I remind us we need to be careful. Let me give you an illustration as I close. Mother walked into the kitchen and her son, her son was in the pantry. The light was on. She saw the crack in the door. <clears throat> and the mother said, Johnny, where are you? He said, in the pantry. She said, what are you doing in the pantry? He said, I'm trying to resist temptation. <laughs> we can't resist temptation if we're in the pantry. If temptation is there, we cannot let it hang around us. We cannot hang on to it. And the lessons from the past that we need to learn, we learn from the Scripture. We see how God deals with our sin. We see how God uh, provides and provides through His Word, the truth of His Word as the example. We are to obey Him, to love Him, surrender to Him, and allow Him to be Lord and King in our lives. Now I realize there's a whole lot of territory been covered. Tremendous number of lessons all compacted into a few moments. But I think the greatest lesson we need to understand, God has given us an example in the Old Testament. And everything that we face, we can go back to the Old Testament and find an answer. Everything that God's done then, He's doing today. He's not circumventing any of His plans and purposes. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever.
we ought to be comforted with the fact God has already pre-written the answer to every aspect of our lives. If we'd simply open the book, study the book, read the book, apply the book, call the Bible. Would you stand please?